been asked when I started, and actually uh, my first full-time work in politics was in the uh, campaign for the mayor of Boston. My Boston neighbors will remember this, some of them. Kevin White in, 19, in October, of, October of 1967. Uh, but if I'd been asked at that point, nearly 45 years ago, and by the way, when I I just had to come to the realization I'm kind of tired and, 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 and need to find other ways to express my efforts to make this a, a fairer country, and that's what I'm planning to do. <clears throat> I got to 45 years and I realized, you know, I started this in 1967, <clears throat> and it occurred to me that if I had encountered somebody when I started out who had the equivalent in political years that I have today, when I would be meeting someone starting out, I'd be talking to someone who got his or her political start during the administration of Warren Harding <laughs> in 1922. So that kind of nudged me. But I do plan to be continuing to work. But if at that time someone had said, okay, indulge in your most optimistic dreams, just say whatever language allows, forget reality, how would you like your years of work to be described when you are about to leave? <coughs> Sheila said it. So Sheila, I am enormously grateful. My, my view is, you know, when you run for office, and she was very kind and said I had to become arrogant. I, let me say, there may be a little hyperbole there, but I will, I will say this. I was no more arrogant after becoming chairman than I was before. <laughs> I, I appreciate the, the spirit of, uh, of, of where we were. Um, but you know, when you run for office, you're asking the other citizens of this democracy to put you to some extent in charge of their lives. And you make laws that are coercive, that make people do things. And I don't think you have any right to even contemplate that unless you were motivated by this view that in the end you're going to make their lives better. Because if you're not going to do that, then, then there's no justification. I try very hard to do that. And Shirley's words meant a lot in part because she has been one of a handful of people who I consider to have been not just my allies, but in some ways my teachers and my guides. And I am very proud. I, I have people who ask me things that I'm proud of as I leave. And um, one of them is the establishment of the Low Income Housing Trust Fund. Now the other side of the I've been asked, what do I regret that hasn't been completed? One, as a Gay man, I have regretted the fact that we have not yet passed the law to make it illegal to discriminate against people based on their sexual orientation and gender and their appointment, although we have in many states. But the other, and uh, the one I mentioned first, is that to date we haven't yet funded the Low Income Housing Trust Fund, but we will. And let me begin with that. We came, we were about a, a year too late in getting it funded. We passed the bill, which included the establishment of the trust fund, and actually we got it done in the House in 2005 um, with Mike Oxley, who as recently as seven years ago, Mike Oxley, a uh, mainstream conservative Republican, was supporting things that would get him drummed out of the right-wing Republican Party of today. And one of the things that, I, that none of us could have foreseen was how far to the right the Republican Party would go, and how our ability to work with mainstream conservatives would be diminished. I think that's temporary, but that set us back. But it was in 2007 that the House passed the bill that established it, and then in 2008, when the Senate came along, and that's to Chris Dodd's credit, to get the Senate, I mean, getting the Senate to move, I will tell you this, I have had this fear for some years now that a fire was going to break out in the Senate, and they would all die because they couldn't get 60 votes to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but <laughs> we had the funding mechanism in place to collapse the Freddie Mac, Freddie Mac came, and we were within a year of funding it, but it is a significant accomplishment in which all of us can take some pride that we haven't established. And if it hadn't been established, I would tell you I would be pessimistic. But at this point, and here is the situation, there is going to have to be a deal to reconstruct housing finance in America. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will go. This hybrid private public doesn't work. And as part of that replacement, we will have the opportunity, and I say we because I will be a part of that fight from a different vantage point, to get the Low Income Housing Trust Fund funded. And I am optimistic for a couple of reasons, but with one proviso, let me be very clear. And uh, I wish I didn't have to be part of it in this regard. But I wish I could eat more and not gain weight. I mean, I wish a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. If you act on your wishes when they're not realistic, you get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, so let me just say it. If Barack Obama is reelected, I believe we will get funding for the Low Income Housing Trust Fund. And if he is not, if he is not, we won't. It will simply not survive any of the current Republican candidates would kill it. Etch a sketch it out of existence. <laughs> <laughs> and but if the president is reelected, as I believe it will be, there will have to be, even if the Democrats don't have both houses of Congress, but there will have to be a deal to replace Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. By the way, the Republicans in 2010, when they were trying desperately to stop any significant financial reform, when they wanted to let derivatives continue to be traded without any restriction and for institutions to have inadequate capital and for loans to be made to people who shouldn't have gotten them, victimizing everybody. They did say, well, our big problem is you haven't done anything about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And in July of June of 2010, they tried very hard to get an amendment adopted on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, just abolishing it, putting nothing in its place. We are about to reach the second anniversary of their offering that amendment. They offered the amendment, it wasn't relevant to the bill, and we said so. And they said, this is outrageous, how can you not do this? Well, I have to give them credit for practicing self-restraint. Because nearly two years after insisting that we had to do something about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they've been in control of the House of Representatives and haven't done a thing. The reason, of course, is that their ideology, which is to have no government role in housing finance at all, is very bad, not for poor people alone, but for middle income people, even for upper middle income people. It is the realtors and the home builders and the mortgage bankers who are telling them that's just too ideologically rigid, you can't do it. And they can't overcome that, but it's going to happen. It will happen, I believe, next year. And I can tell you that I have spoken to the people in the Obama administration. I'm not there, it could happen next year. But I know they are sincerely committed. As part of any deal, and this is what all of you have to insist on, and you have to hold everybody in Congress to, and hold the administration to, there should be no deal to restructure housing finance in America without some of the revenue, a fairly small part of the money being generated, going to fund the Low Income Housing Trust Fund. And we're talking about a billion dollars then, it should be more than that, it should be uh, in indexed for inflation. There will be fees paid for housing guarantees, and I, I believe we are well positioned to insist on that. And for a couple of reasons, one of them is that there is now a recognition that we were right when we talked about the importance of a significant range of options for low-income people in housing, including significant rental options. This denigration of rental housing, the, uh, they kind of capitalized, you know, and I, I ran into this for years when I would talk about rental housing. I could just see, like in a cartoon, the bubble over my colleagues' heads in which they were picturing Columbia Point or Caprini Green or Fruit Idol. Now, it is true that a lot of poor people live in terrible housing built with public money. What is also true is that it wasn't their idea. They didn't decide to build 
towers of thousands of units with no services out in, the, in, a, in a bleak area. It was society's grudging saying, well, we got to do it, let's do it as cheap as possible. We know how to build affordable housing in an attractive way. And as you know, one of the things that I'm proud that we were able to do is we intervened beginning in the 80s, because coming from Boston, I saw this coming. You go into Boston, you go to the south end of Boston, and there's a lot of housing that was built with subsidies to developers back when that was not a desirable neighborhood. And then it became a desirable neighborhood, and our problem is to try and protect the restricted income tenancies from the gentrifiers, because that housing, far from being terrible, is now so attractive because of where it is, people want to move in there. And that's one of the things we have to deal with, this notion that having uh, affordable housing for low-income people somehow destroys the neighborhood. I've said this before for some of you. At Boston Friends, give a tour of Boston and go to the corners of Tremont Street and Arlington Street in downtown Boston. And there were two buildings I want you to look at. There were two buildings to, uh, to look at. One is a development called Castle Square. It was one of the first 221 D3s in America. Affordable housing. And in the middle of it is a public housing unit for the elderly. So this is subsidized housing, hundreds of units. It was, by the way, very important. It was racially integrated at the time when in Boston, racial tensions were even worse. And I noted when I first got there in 1972 at a particular goal, there were parts of Boston where African Americans didn't feel safe and there were parts of Boston where white people didn't feel safe. And what do you do if you are a black white couple? <laughs> In Boston in the 60s and 50s, there, there was a serious safety issue. No, you were rich enough, you could move out and, and, and have all protection. And I noted that Castle Square, which was built in a kind of a border area, was a haven for a lot of interracial couples at a time when they didn't have a lot of choices. Well, that's remained an affordable housing complex. Across Tremont Street, from that affordable housing complex, is the most expensive luxury housing in America. It's, it's a building called Atelier. It's a condominium where you get first class hotel services. Now, if it were true, and by the way, the low income housing was there first. And the luxury housing, people built this most expensive, I think the square foot, it is as expensive as any housing in Boston, and Boston is one of the top housing markets. So it's maybe not, it's not Manhattan, and it's not uh, uh, Beverly Hills, but it's got to be in one of the top 10 locations for per square foot expense. And the fact that it's across the street from affordable housing has had no impact. And it's across the street now. I don't like to over-argue my case. The street that it's across is a very wide one. Vermont <laughs> <laughs> Street has got like six lanes and a median strip in the middle. So maybe the answer is you have to have a median strip to keep, to keep low income housing from deteriorating affordable housing. I think we can spring for a couple median strips. But the point is that we have been building for decades affordable housing that is very desirable. Now we have this argument because people said, oh no, there was a denigration of people who lived in rental housing, whether it was public housing or other kinds of housing. Um, I had one high-ranking official of the Clinton administration say to me, well, nobody ever washed a rented car. Said, well, they wash leased cars. I don't know why that's relevant, but uh, <laughs> uh, that, the, the implication was that if you rent to people, they won't take care of their home. Well, we know that's not true. And it was the, the housing crisis that came came because people were given loans in part who they shouldn't, who, who shouldn't have been given the loans, the terms weren't fair, there were those problems. But there was a push factor. And I learned this when I went to Minneapolis at the request of one of my great colleagues, Keith Ellison, to do a housing hearing, I think in 2007. And uh, they had some representative couples, and one of the couples said, well, here's the problem. Um, they, they, they were in foreclosure. The problem was, they said, we were evicted from our apartment. And we went to try and find another apartment. We couldn't find one. So we bought a house. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That was the absence of that option. 
So I gotta eat building more. rental housing is very important. Now, I, I, so I take some yeah. optimistic view here because people understand that now. One of the great things that's happening now is Obama administration, the Bank of America, others, they've rediscovered rental housing. People understand that we have an inventory of housing that can be used for rental housing. And I believe that the, there is now an understanding, which there wasn't when, when we were starting on this, that rental housing is not the last resort when nothing else is available. It is a very appropriate way to go for, for uh, many people for a variety of reasons. And so I, that's why I'm optimistic. There's going to have to be a deal on affordable ho on, uh, housing finance. And I have spoken to, and I, I'm, if, if, if my Republican colleagues are ready to do it today, the realtors understand this, the home builders, the administration, we are ready. And I think we are in a position, by we, I mean those of us who are in this level of the advocacy, uh, in, in this part of the advocacy movement, there shall be no deal for restructuring housing finance in America unless funding the Low Income Housing Trust Fund is a part of it. It's a very simple argument. <laughs> the money isn't that great. And, we can do it. and so, the other thing I want to talk about is what Gil mentioned. Um, we are, uh, at this point, going to have to reduce the budget deficit. There's no question. The amount the United States is now spending and will continue to spend on the military if we don't make a drastic change makes it very unlikely. I believe, by the way, because they, they're going to need a, a broad coalition to get housing finance, we'll get the housing trust fund. But other programs that we need for housing or for anything else involving the quality of life, for Section 8 renewals, for not having the uh, gentrification, to, that will be in serious jeopardy. Right, well, let me put it this way. It will be a scant victory if we get the housing trust fund funded and that is then deducted from other housing funds. Part of our deal is that that is additive to the funding we are now getting, which is already too little. But that cannot happen over the long term if we do not substantially reduce America's military spending. And I talked about... I talk about what I do where I, I look at where we are and I project backwards. And I projected backwards from my own career in 1922. NATO was a great accomplishment by Harry Truman and some Republicans in Congress in 1949. It was 63 years ago. If you go back in time from NATO, as far as we are since NATO, you are, I think, in the in first administration, I haven't checked it, but maybe, yeah, no, it, it's true. We're in the first administration of President Grover Cleveland. Now, I submit to you very few institutions of American government or world relationships have remained substantially unchanged since Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland has not left a great legacy except for one thing, some of you may not realize Civil it, is a Grover Cleveland legacy. He left us a candy bar. <laughs> Baby Ruth. Baby Ruth is not named after Bay Ruth. Baby Ruth was the daughter of President Cleveland, who during his second term married a younger woman and they had a child and she was Baby Ruth. But we're not talking about the first term, so <laughs> we're, we're talking about before there was a Baby Ruth. Much less a candy bar named for her. We were, yes, he was from Buffalo. <laughs> he, was the sheriff. he was the sheriff of Buffalo. Um, he, Harry Truman did a great thing. He protected the weak and poor nations of Western Europe against a brutal Stalin. They're not weak and poor. There's no more Soviet Union. We're still spending billions of dollars there. The war in Afghanistan, we should be withdrawing right away. It is good. Let me say this. I'm not going to talk a long time about it, but here's my basic view about the military. The American military is a superb force, and they are very good at doing what a military can do, which is to stop bad things from happening. But a military cannot make good things happen. 
<clears throat> the best trained and armed and well motivated 25 year old American can't go into Afghanistan and create a society there like there's never been before. Or, 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 or he, he heal religious divisions in Iraq or do some of these other things. And we wind up doing more harm than good, which is a great tragedy given the motivation of the people. So it is very simple. Let's be the strongest nation. Well, here's the fundamental mistake people made. Uh, America did not have a huge military until 1941 because we had oceans and nobody could reach us. And then in 19, 